will have two. In the first session of this morning, there will be two talks. Uh, the first one is from Luigi Genovese from Chad Grenoble. Uh, so he will talk about his research on the this density functional theory calculations applications that was mentioned yesterday at the last talk by Williamson. So Luigi, please have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for providing me the opportunity to discuss with you some of those, uh, some of those achievements. As uh, and it's, as it had been mentioned, and uh, this talk somehow uh, covers some of the topics which were already mentioned by William uh, uh, yesterday evening. So uh, I hope that. Uh, these will help in clarifying all the further points uh, uh, or to introduce you some of the topics we are still actively working on if uh, you had not the occasion to attend yesterday's talk. So this talk is mainly related to uh, a, a new set of, uh, uh, let's say, paradigms of investigation we are now working on uh, thanks to the advent of large-scale calculation in density functional theory. Essentially, uh, I will try not to focus too much on uh, uh, performance figures related to our code, but rather on trying to uh, uh, showing you what are the questions we are trying to ask ourselves now when we have available a, a set of uh, formalisms that enable us to calculate uh, very large systems in a uh, relatively efficient way on modern architectures. So essentially, uh, those considerations are based on the big DFT code, uh, which William mentioned yesterday, uh, but some of those considerations can be mutuated also in other formalisms. So I believe it's interesting to also address uh, the potential generality of such considerations. So for those who may not know uh, uh, the context in which the Big DFT project uh, arose, essentially the idea of Big DFT is, uh, of course, it is a relatively young code, even though it is now developed since more than one decade. Uh, and it is a code which inscribes itself into a rich panorama of density functional theory code, which are already available uh, for the scientific community and with different formalisms. The main advantage of the big DFT code is that uh, it employs a formalism uh, that uh, may enable to treat uh, in a systematic uh, approach uh, systems which have inhomogeneous and localized information. Essentially, the basis set in which Big DFT is conceived is a, a, a basis set which has been known in signal processing since the late 70s. The name is Dobeshi's wavelets for those who have heard about, which somehow combines uh, the uh, uh, potential, the, the, the let's say, uh, good uh, properties of uh, uh, both solid state and quantum chemistry approaches. Dobeshi's wavelets is a systematic and localized basis set. Essentially, the advantage of big DFT code is uh, uh, somehow to uh, uh, being able to develop, to express into a, a, a set of moderate degrees of freedom, uh, localized and compact information. Uh, that is why we have started this project in the beginning of 2008 with the idea of testing the potential advantages of this formalism. We were not knowing where we, will go, we, we were about to go by testing this approach. And the ideas which are presented uh, in this talk uh, come from the availability of such a formalism where it is possible to uh, somehow uh, uh, think at the consham description in terms of contracted wavelet basis. So 
there will be no time to discuss the properties of wavelets here. The main advantage is that, uh, uh, as I said, uh, you can refine the resolution of the description only in the region where it is needed, and that uh, you can complete your basis set by decreasing uh, somehow the spacing between the different uh, uh, position of the wavelet. So it's kind of a localized cutoff for uh, for uh, calculations. So uh, uh, regardless of those points, which are mainly associated to the technicalities, uh, essentially the main advantage in this context is related to the usage of this basis to create a linear scaling density functional theory code. So in the context of density functional theory, uh, we uh, can create a, a basis set, an intermediate basis set, which in turn is expressed on wavelets. This intermediate basis set is employed to express the consham orbitals of the system. Uh, the advantage, as this basis set is, is expressed on wavelet, is that it can be optimized locally with respect to the chemical environment of the system. Essentially, the point is that instead of working directly with the basis, uh, the, wa the wavelet basis and the consham orbitals, we work with this intermediate localized basis set. We may think at of it as a contracted wavelet basis set, which uh, essentially is uh, adapted to the local environment of the system. As this basis set is constructed by definition uh, within localized supports, uh, the, the resulting matrices which come out from the consham uh, formalism are sparse, and this enables pave the way towards the implementation of a linear scaling approach, where uh, uh, the sizes of the system, which can be simulated, is considerably larger than the one where uh, the consham orbitals are defined on the entire simulation domain. So uh, there are algorithms that is imp are implemented into the big DFT code, where the idea is essentially to first create a optimal basis set, which minimizes the trace of the consham Hamiltonian, and, and, and then find the self-consistency by expressing the density matrix of the system, the object which is highlighted here in red, within this basis set. So this is the main introductory part of the of the the approach i wanted to uh, keep it uh, most uh, concise in order to express what can now uh, be done with such kind of approach but of course big dft has also a, another set of functionalities which are more traditional and based on traditional cubic scaling approaches in wavelet. So for these, it's also, it also presents interesting features of flexibility and, and uh, uh, interesting performances, but I will not discuss these, uh, more, these traditional aspects uh, uh, today. What I wanted to uh, essentially uh, stress is that uh, we have now, we had since now more than five years, a formalism that enable us to express the density, the electronic structure of systems of many thousand atoms, even tens of thousand atoms. We will see some examples uh, in, in, uh, in what comes. But then I uh, tried to ask myself at this time when we were about to finalize the development of this code, what could be the interest, which may be the mindsets, the investigation mindsets in which uh, it is meaningful to treat an entire uh, uh, system at a, a full quantum mechanical level of theory. And we will see that such kind of framework, the fact of having localized and optimized the basis function, is a kind of an ideal framework to try to extract more information about the uh, system uh, electronic structure than the one that can be extracted via the traditional approach. Uh, essentially, uh, we have at hand a, a code, or let's say a, a, a different uh, uh, set of approximations that uh, can be expressed in the same basis set, 
and that can enable us to chain different level of accuracy, or I should say different level of precision in the results, uh, uh, that would uh, express the degrees of freedom of the system at uh, a different level of granularity. Now, uh, let's give some of the ideas which I want uh, to uh, somehow discuss uh, today. We have wrote, we have, we wrote a, a, a review article in 2007, 2016, where uh, some of those uh, consideration were, were explained, and not only, once again, with respect to the big DFT code, but also with respect to other formalisms available in the community. So what I'm going to present is, is, is something that uh, can be generalized also to other large scale DFT codes. Uh, and essentially the concept is the following. Uh, the fact of treating many thousand atom systems open up a new opportunity. We enter into a, uh, a region here in this cartoon I have uh, uh, written essentially in the x-axis the sizes of the atoms that are the, the atomistic systems which are uh, which are treated in uh, uh, different communities and essentially uh, what is interesting here is that uh, we come from a community uh, chemistry, material science, uh, computational physics, uh, which essentially treat systems of uh, small scale, let's say below 1000 atoms. But there are communities which usually employ uh, uh, interesting approaches atomistically for sizes which are traditionally too large to be simulated with DFT. Now, it is possible to bridge those gaps and somehow to connect to different communities in uh, uh, chaining somehow the quantum mechanical description of the system with the uh, traditional approaches which are not based on quantum mechanics that are well established in other communities. So that sounds like a, a, general, a general framework, but essentially the point is the following. Uh, with DFT, we can extract insights from the calculation of the system of such sizes in a different way than the one which can be extracted when it only uh, uh, matters of calculate few dozen atoms. Essentially, we don't treat DFT at uh, 10,000 atom regimes in the same way in which we would have treated that for 10 atoms, because there are many challenges that uh, at those sizes will be difficult to, to resolve. For example, we may ask ourselves if a given DFT functional is pertinent to treat a particular mechanism, for example, an enzymatic reaction, rather than to use a force field that would give us the result in a more rapid way. Or with the DFT, is it meaningful to move atoms and to capture some portion of the configurational space? That are questions which are very difficult to answer. And for this reason, I believe that it is not in this direction, especially not now, uh, that DFT can provide interesting point. Uh, it is already interesting to employ the, the density functional theory approach to get insights on how a given the, uh, many large system is, is described somehow. And that explains the reason of the title of this talk. I'm coming to my main point where uh, the uh, idea is to interpret the electronic structure of a large system and understand out of this interpretation how a system can be decomposed into building blocks which are coherent chemically and physically speaking and how those building blocks may interact each other. Let's uh, this is a 11, it's a 10 amino acid peptide. So this is a system which is very common in biology. It's a, it's a community which employed other approaches since now in DFT, in the rather than DFT. Of course, uh, uh, the biologist would see the system as it is highlighted on the right-hand side of the plot with a collection of amino acids. 
the DFT code would see the system as it is written in the left side plot. Uh, but if we have at hand a localized set of basis functions, which would enable us to express interactions of the different between the different building blocks of the system between the different basis function we can perform a granular uh, interpretation a granular matrix where uh, the interactions between the amino acids are written here it's a simple reduction of the consham hamiltonian of the system if one wants and pro projected into the basis functions associated to the atoms of each amino acids and that would provide us an interaction matrix this is a very simple approach of course nothing new beyond that and especially what it's interesting here is that it is the user of this approach which defined the, the fragment of the system. We have arbitrarily decomposed the system into amino acids. And that comes from the natural consensus in biology. But uh, could we implement more information and extract more information from the system on the left side? Essentially, uh, is it possible to extract the fragmentation of an unknown system as a unbiased, in an unbiased way, as a post-processing of the calculation, the idea would be somehow to understand if the density matrix of the system contain enough information to tell us how the fragments of the system have to be interpreted in uh, the concept of this reduction of the complexity. So essentially, we come to the main point of this talk. The idea is to uh, consider if the density matrix can be decomposed into idempotent blocks. Why idempotent? Because we all know that a density matrix for a well-behaved system is an idempotent operator. So if a fragmentation may exist, uh, we would like uh, to preserve this idempotency the more uh, as most as possible also on the building blocks of the system. Essentially, the procedure would be the following. Let's imagine that we would like to split a system in two. This would be our small uh, system. We split them in two. So we now have our density matrix, which become a two by two block matrix. And this two by two block matrix is arbitrary, potentially, because we have decided how to split the matrix. And of course, uh, as these are only portions of the full system, they no longer satisfy the hidden potency condition. So if we want to satisfy the hidden potency condition of the matrix, uh, we uh, should try to arrange the partitioning of the system in the best possible way, in a better way at least, so that we have an indicator, which is just uh, the difference of either between idem potency, uh, the, the, this, the deviation from idem potency of this fragment matrix that provides us how much a given fragment projection uh, would deviate. With this indicator, we can agnostically decompose uh, the system, sorry, into fragments and verify if a provided biologically friendly decomposition is also meaningful from the point of view of a quantum perspective. Uh, this is uh, uh, also uh, decorated from the fact that uh, the fragments uh, defined in that way have also a notion of chemical order or bond order between them. So with the same approach, by uh, inspecting the off-diagonal blocks of the so defined, so decomposed matrix, we obtain an indicator that quantify the strength of the interaction between the different fragments. So here, that's an example of the different mindset I was referring to before. We had a large system, and we didn't treat anymore this large system as a whole. We employed the full calculation to decompose the system into blocks that are mutually interacting and use such kind of decomposition as a descriptor for the interaction of the system. So essentially the concept of the complexity reduction is to employ two indicators which are not arbitrary and are expressed thanks to the locality of the approach 
uh, employs those indicator to define and divide large systems into chemically meaningful fragments which have a well-defined chemical interaction. If one wants to map those indicators to what are quantities which are already well known in DFT, in quantum chemistry, we should say that the purity indicator is similar to a valence. So a fragment is a kind of a closed shell uh, system and the bond order is really the standard bond order between uh, between the fragments uh, that of course are always measured with respect to, to some threshold. So in the last part of my presentation, I would like to try to present a few examples of applications we have made in the recent months. We have published a few papers in this direction, other are upcoming. So we have an algorithm that automatically reorganizes the system in a completely agnostic way into fragments and provide a graph view of the system where the fragments interact each other. And we can express any quantum mechanical observables onto these fragments up to a given level of confidence, because we know that this purity indicator is there to assist us in understanding whether this fragmentation is meaningful in our basis set. So essentially, what can be done? We can do things like these ones, where we take a full uh, monoclonal antibody, uh, where we actually investigate the interaction between the uh, uh, antibody and the antigen, but on a fragment point of view. So I understand that this plot is very small to be, uh, to be seen, but essentially the point is that in the X and the Y axis, we have the amino acids of the epitope and the paratop regions, which are the two regions of the antibody and the antigen, which should interact each other, but uh, decomposed in terms of fragments, and we see that those fragments don't necessarily correspond to single amino acids. There are regions of the system for which the fragmentation is larger. And this enables us to identify which are the potential interactors in a biological system. And this is of great importance for those who want to do antibody engineering or to understand the potential impact of point mutations in biological systems, because one can inspect populations of those data. Why I say population of those data? Because such kind of calculation, thanks to big DFT uh, features, can be indeed performed in a relatively moderate set of, of, of computational resources. With one hour of wall time and 32 nodes, one can extract one single point of this 22,000 atom system. So we can perform, with the advent of exascale machines, thousands of such kind of calculation in the same time frame. So we can perform populations of analysis, uh, analysis of populations of these quantities, which would provide us post treatment of quantum of molecular dynamics trajectories, as well as libraries of point mutations uh, uh, effect on the interaction and uh, uh, similar things. So. To conclude the last parts of my talk is just to say that we were into this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, business when the pandemic came. And this was, uh, I should say, a fortunate situation for us because we had had the possibility to interact with many new groups where we put in application those concepts with the idea of connecting density functional theory results with biological uh, uh, data. Among the different collaborations we, we are kind of, con of uh, 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 conducting, it would be interesting to pr briefly present such paper, which went out in chemical science uh, uh, not three months ago, where uh, uh, we collaborated together with uh, William, of course, with people coming from the community of drug design, especially uh, docking, uh, uh, docking uh, and molecular dynamics uh, mechanisms uh, in conjunction with experiment, uh, with experimentalists, where we analyzed the interaction pattern of the inhibitors of the SARS-CoV-2 main protease. Essentially, big DFT was able to produce descriptors which behave like that. Here we have in the nodes of the system, the residues, the amino acids of the different inhibitors which were treated. These are the natural substrates of 
SARS-CoV-2 main protease. And those descriptors are then, uh, those uh, fragments are then arranged in a graph where the width of the edges is associated to the fragment bond order and the color of the node is associated to the strength of the interaction. By considering those descriptors as uh, another fingerprint of the interaction, we were able to compare among each other different substrates and different inhibitors uh, which have had the different chemical origin. So this was an example about the usage of such kind of uh, approaches which are completely agnostic because they come from a, a first principle set of calculations and are, I, I believe, uh, that relatively different in the way, from the way in which we employ DFT at smaller scale. scale. And those descriptors can be put in direct relation with other treatment, other formalisms, docking scores, molecular dynamics trajectories, entropic contributions uh, in the long term, if one do a uh, population analysis. All those calculations come from molecular dynamics trajectories. So behind these graph, each of these graphs, there is at least a hundred of density functional theory calculation of that sizes. Uh, and we can pave the way towards a, a different conception of these descriptors in the concept of, let's say, uh, 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 artif uh, artificial intelligence or uh, molecular uh, or uh, neural network in general. So essentially, uh, in coming to the conclusion, the KCO message is that when, when one has the possibility of calculating a very large system, uh, it's interesting to analyze the properties of the density matrix. We have found that uh, it is chemically interesting to investigate uh, the way in which the fragments of the system emerge out of the density matrix without potentially prior knowledge. And that is possible thanks to those indicators, which are once again completely general and not necessarily associated to big DFT. But at the end, we have a representation of an interaction another representation of an interaction which come from a density functional theory code. And uh, uh, we can put that in conjunction with uh, the way in which modifications on the system may alter the uh, interaction. Uh, the advantage of having a code like uh, the one I have mentioned here is that we can perform uh, hundreds of thousands of simulations on a short time frame and therefore enabling new opportunities for connecting between two these communities which uh, were not uh, so connected since uh, since now so we are now working on the possibility of putting those kind of approaches at the level of a quantum as a service approach because those approaches are kind of relatively easy to automatize so one may even imagine a workflow that uh, uh, somehow characterize a pdb structure a, a crystallographic structure in that way and uh, i believe that this is essentially my last uh, my last slide uh, we are we are actually trying to, to identify new ways of using DFT. And uh, I believe that this way has proven effective, uh, at least in the recent years, when there were this new scientific market, uh, uh, let's say, open thanks to the COVID emergency. Uh, so I think it is worth to continue inspecting the possibility of using large scale DFT on massively parallel uh, uh, HPC resources. Uh, to match uh, uh, communities of uh, uh, people that were not necessarily used to work together and create potentially interesting opportunities for collaborations. Uh, I hope I didn't pass too much the allotted time, so I'm sorry if so. And, Don't worry, uh, we started a bit late, so uh, I think it's not, it's not uh, open yes. for questions. I haven't seen any questions from the chat, so just unmute yourself. You have your questions. Uh, actually, Volker raised his hand, so maybe let him start first. Volker, you are muted. Great talk. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm muted. Um, no problem. Forgot about this. So I have a few heretic questions. So first of all, first of all, this is this is this is great work, right? And the, the heretic questions are 
just well uh, heresy really so and I, I guess there are two categories Please. one is that now we have um, alpha fold and so we can machine learning everything about proteins and so we don't need dfd anymore right and that, that's one question so the second question which is more narrow i wanted to ask is about uh, covid so this is this is great that you can actually do simulations in this direction but what is it that uh, that community actually needs that we can concretely help with right so understanding how the subsystems absolutely. work is one thing but absolutely that's a, treat, uh, treat, right? anyway so those two questions that that's perfect. Uh, I, I, I thank you for those questions, actually, because those are points which I ask myself continuously. Why should they use other tools with respect to the one which already exists? There are two reasons. Essentially, one should interpret those tools not at uh, perfect modeling tools, but uh, tools which help the biologist for making decisions. Let's take this example here. If you want to engineer a drug, for example, sorry, I want to engineer a drug and I want to understand which are the main residues which are important for this drug. With this kind of tool, of course, I, I can deploy docking scores, other established techniques, but here I would ask my DFT and say, okay, which are the residues which are important, for example, for the stability of this fragment of the drug? the glutamine P1 of the natural substrate interact naturally with those residues here. If I have the docking or approaches which work with structures, of course I can quantify that by having a look at the distance, but uh, there are many factors contributing to the interaction. Here I have shown the chemical interaction. I could have shown also the long range electrostatic interaction between residues. And I would have get information that I have seen treated as very useful from biologists because the point is exactly that. When it comes to model structures, we still don't know, the biologist would like to understand we, where are the critical points for a given set of interaction. With such kind of tool, one can provide some answers to explain where the critical points reside. For instance, I made this example of the antibody engineering. This residue here, the serine 52 of the paratop, for example, is a very strong interactor here. The biologists would know that this residue shouldn't be modified if we want to strengthen the interaction between antibody and antigen. Actually, we have recently applied those considerations to the Omicron variant. Uh, if you want, you can go uh, browsing on BioArchive. You will find a preprint on my name where we have tried to investigate why the mutations of Omicron variants seems to be more dangerous than the one of the Delta or of the wild type. So we have actually have employed the display ground to try to understand. So essentially, it is a, a new set of descriptors that may match with previously existing one. I believe that there will be lots of redundancy between this information, but at least here, the advantage is that this is descriptor is completely unbiased. So if we have a system that is not decomposed into amino acids, or if you have a different set of systems, metalloproteins or something fancy for biologists, from the initial point of view, this is totally agnostic may not be the silver ball, of course, but at least I believe it's worth trying. I, I hope I have answered my, your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay, we need to move on to the next presentation. Let's okay. thank uh, Luigi. Uh, it's a pleasure. Luigi, there are questions on, this, on the chat, so if you get a chance, you may... Uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Pleasure. It's uh, a pleasure. Our, our next, next talk is from... Uh, Romia Amaro from UCSD. He's going to talk about in situ computational microscopy of uh, the SARS CoV 2 virus. Are you on the line? <laughs> 